Okay, let's start. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Zhichen Zhao from Tianjin University. Uh, welcome to our series of virtual academic seminars to celebrate the launch of SmartMed. Uh, SmartMed is an open access journal co-launched by Wiley and the Tianjin University. I'm one of the social editors of SmartMed. Uh, the editors-in-chief of SmartMed are Professor Wen Pinghu from Tianjin University and uh, Professor Hua Zhang from City University of Hong Kong. Today, Professor Jin Zhong Zhang from University of California, uh, Santa Cruz, will give the presentation. Now, I'd like to briefly introduce Professor Zhang first. Uh, Jin Zhong Zhang received his bachelor degree in chemistry from Fudan University, Shanghai, China, in 1983, and uh, his PhD in physical chemistry from University of Washington, Seattle, in 1989. Uh, he was a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of California, Berkeley, from 1989 to 1992. In 1992, he joined the faculty of UC Santa Cruz, uh, where he is uh, currently distinguished professor of chemistry and uh, biochemistry. Professor Zhang's recent research interests focus on design, uh, synthesis, characterization, and the exploration of applications uh, of uh, advanced materials. Uh, including semiconductor, uh, metal, metal oxide nanomaterials, uh, particularly in the area of solar energy conversion, uh, solid state lighting, sensing, and uh, biomedical detection uh, therapy. He has also the over 390 publications and three books. Uh, John is currently executive editor for JPCL and the social editor for ACS Physical Chemistry, uh, gold published by ACS. Uh, he is a fellow of AAS, APS, IC, and uh, SES. Uh, he is a recipient of the 2014 uh, Richard uh, Glenn Award of the SES Energy and the Fuel Division. Today, Professor Zhang will give a talk about uh, lower prop uh, properties of plasmonic metal nanostructures for sensing and uh, cancer therapy, a case study of hollow gold nanospheres. Uh, let's welcome. Professor Zhang, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, it's okay. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Zhang, and uh, for the very kind introduction. Before I start, I'd like to thank Professor Zhang Zicheng and uh, Zhang Jin, and uh, also uh, uh, Professor Zhang for hosting this. And uh, we spent a lot of time uh, setting things up. Thank you very much. And also, I'd like to thank SmartMed and Wiley for this opportunity to share with you a little bit of some of the research I've been involved over the last uh, uh, several decades. So let me get the slides going and then uh, we can, uh, you know, uh, okay, I'll get started so soon. Let me put the window so I can see. I like to use hand gesture sometimes, so I wanna see, be able to see myself. I'm sorry I cannot see all of you. And also there are, I know there are um, many friends also uh, uh, you're participating including visitors and uh, uh, student, former student visitors and many friends. And uh, I don't say hi, and uh, sorry I cannot uh, greet each one of you individually, okay? Just say on, hi online. All right, so yeah, I'm gonna use this opportunity to talk to you about one project. Actually, this project has been going on in my lab for 28 years. And as Professor John introduced, I started my career at UCSC in 1992, and uh, to, now it's 20, 22, so it's exactly 30 years. So I'm near the end of my 30th year here at UC Santa Cruz. This project I'm sharing with you today started in 1994, uh, so 28 years. And it's a project very close and dear to my heart, as you can see why. And we're still working on this, okay? So this is a, a long uh, a project spanning almost three decades. And hopefully, you are, uh, I, I wanna share with you some of these uh, highlights and uh, you agree that uh, there's some interesting properties with uh, plasmonic metal nanostructures, particularly hollow gold nanospheres, which we use for surface enhanced Raman scattering, sensing, and also use for cancer therapy. And um, since it's a sort of more general audience, I want to keep the discussion at a you know little more general higher level. If you are interested in any aspect in more detail. I'm more than happy to discuss with you uh, later on. 
and I put my email there. So the email is just zhang at ucsc.edu. And I welcome any comments or discussion following the lecture later. All right, so my lab works on not just the plasmonic metal structures. Actually, we spend more time on quantum dots, uh, semiconductor quantum dots, both doped and undoped, for the most part in our lab over the years. But today, we'll focus on plasmonics. We also work on metal oxides that are used for energy conversion and also sensing applications. So on the left, you see a picture of quantum dots. And we have been, as I said, we have been working on this for since I started at UCSC. On the right hand side, this is a picture of hollow gold nanospheres, which we'll be talking about today. So if I ask you a question, what is the color of gold? Most of, we, most of us would say gold is golden, right? So it's a yellowish, orangish color. Now, if you make them into nanoparticles, many researchers will know they are red in color, like a red wine, like a burgundy color, beautiful burgundy color. However, I want to convince you today that you can make any color you want from gold when you control the shape and the size. Yeah, get the slides going here. Okay, perfect. Okay, I just want to give a very quick general motivation. Also, I want to give you some background, a little bit of history, but I do want to bring in uh, new research working on in the last few years, okay? So I'll start with some history, background, just to put things into perspective to help better understand why we're doing what we're doing right now. Research is not a straight line. Research has you know, up and downs, and that's exactly what happens with this project as well. And I wanna share with you some of the up and downs and uh, uh, you know, see how we progressed from 28 years ago to today. Our motivation in general in the lab has been to address issues that can help us to address challenges and also explore opportunities in the next several decades. And we're all aware that there are a lot of challenges in terms of resources, energy, and health. Speaking about health, we're dealing with the pandemic, COVID, right now. And actually, the last project will end today is related to COVID uh, using sensing, using SIRS from our lab. The paper is to be submitted. And of course, a lot of environmental issues. I grab a few pictures from the web. This is just to illustrate these issues are beyond just the issues themselves. They have implications with stability, security, and in the world on the global scale. So nanomaterials, that's what we focus on in my lab. So my lab is an optical laser spectroscopy and a nanomaterials lab. So the two keywords, optical, laser, slash, and then nanomaterials. That's what we have been focusing on for 30 years. We are interested in exploring the electronic, dynamic and optical properties of nanomaterials and hope to use them as materials or building blocks to build devices to address some of the issues I outlined in the previous slide. Specific issues of interest to us include size, surface, shape, and of course crystal structure and electron structure. So they determine the optical properties. And application-wise, as I mentioned already, we have been focusing on sensing and biomedical, as well as light-related applications, including light to electricity, light to chemical fuel, or backward from electricity to light, like a light emitting diode, or sensors, etc. And more recently, we are working on uh, information-related technology, quantum information, single photon sensor, uh, a single photon emitters, uh, spin-related properties, but I'll not be talking about that today here, okay? Just to make you a few. Okay, here's where I will talk about plasmonics, but I want to contrast quantum dots, in part because we work on both. And the reason is that there are interesting similarities and differences between semiconductor nanomaterials and the plasmonic metal nanomaterials. And this will help us to understand the difference and the similarity when we design or explore their properties. For quantum dots, they are just like a large molecule, if you want. Okay, so if you, you can think about, we start with atoms, like a single atom, hydrogen or oxygen, whatever you want to uh, uh, use as an example. We know they have discretized energy levels, uh, like hydrogen, 1s orbital, 2s orbital, 2p orbital, etc. The orbitals may or may not be occupied by electrons. So imagine the example here will be helium atom. You have two electrons, dots occupy the ground state. You have a, we have an excited state that's unoccupied with no electrons. There's a gap between them, 
essential that's a band gap in semiconductor field, okay? And a homo lumo in organic chemistry. In any case, this means quantum mechanically, there are no other states between those two states. So it's a gap, okay? It's not allowed. This is the essence of quantum mechanics. Now, if we take atoms that sort of build up larger systems, imagine clusters, nanoparticles, or eventually bulk material, meaning you have Avogadro numbers, 10 to 23rd atoms or molecules, they are clumped together or bonded together to form a large chunk of solid. And we know from quantum mechanics that when you build them up from small to large, eventually you may end up with a band gap if you have a semiconductor or insulator. This band gap determines the electronic and optical properties of the semiconductor or insulator. Silicon, for example, is about 1,000 nanometer, the band gap in, uh, in nanometer, or 1.1 electron volt, if you prefer that. The valence band means occupied states here with electrons. The empty one conducting band is empty, no electrons. But we can promote electrons from the valence band to the conducting band using, for example, light. For a semiconductor or molecule or insulator, as long as the light intensity is weak, is not too strong, like a very powerful laser, then you normally have a one photon, one electron transition at any given time. So it's a single photon, single electron transition. So it's a relatively easy. So quantum dots compared to plasmonics we'll be talking about next, actually are simpler because it's just a larger molecule. You have a single electron transition. You can describe this using quantum mechanics. So they are pretty well understood. So now you have the quantum confinement. If you can make them smaller, they absorb bluer because if you make them smaller, that means we're going right to left. The gap become larger, the absorption become bluer, okay? Because the energy gap is the inverse proportion to wavelength. All right, so that's quantum dots, okay? And this has been now, we have been working on dynamics of this system for many years. And uh, that's, we use a laser, that's a specialty in our lab. This is the second generation laser in our lab currently. We'll acquire a new Fentazan laser with even enhanced capability in a few months. And the way we do dynamic study is to use the two femtosecond pulses, do so-called pump probe. And uh, this can give us a femtosecond time resolution, which no other technique can do. And on the right, you see a general illustration of a wave. This wave can be space, time, or energy dependent. Those are issues we need to think about when we study molecules or nanoparticles or any material using light. Um, so you can, of course, today, not only use the optical pulses, you can use uh, femtosecond pixels and x-rays. These are available in Berkeley and Stanford within about two hour drive from UCSC. Uh, I was very fortunate to be a part, small part of two studies in collaboration with many scientists using femtosecond pixels and x-rays. But these are very expensive machines, okay? The laser in my lab is about half US million dollars. But this machine I'm showing you here using synchrotron is half a billion US dollars. So these are not something you can have in your lab. But uh, the main point of the, uh, uh, I mentioning this here is that there are techniques you can use today. Now you wonder why do we use such expensive machines? What's the advantage? The advantage of X-rays is that they are element specific. They are atomic specific. Well, optical study lasers are only molecular specific, not atomic specific. So these are better, but they're very much more expensive. Okay, back to our research. Uh, we started back in 92 on uh, cadmium sulfide nano, uh, quantum dots or nanoparticles. We studied all these, these are actually uh, a part of the earlier studies. And actually our lab was the first one that started to study quantum dots systematically using femtosecond laser spectroscopy back 30 years ago. And as you can see, we also study metal nanoparticles after that, which is the focus of my talk today. And what we get is a lifetime measurement here. We have a signal, we have time in you know, five picosecond or longer or 250. We do a lot of control experiments, changing size, surface, uh, shape, and we do build models to understand what's going on. So I'll show you one example, I'll show you here. So here's the model we built up based on many, many years of research. So we understand the trapping process, recombination process, try to relate to fundamental applications or technological applications we are interested. 
But I want to show you one slide from my former PhD student, Jason Cooper. This is the best illustrates why we care about dynamics. He said, why should we care about dynamics? Uh, it's expensive. It's a long, pretty long training for students. Here's an example. If we have a solar cell or photo detector, and initially we have a frank content transition, the electron is promoted from the valence band to the conducting band. We have light with energy above the band gap. Now, if we, all you care is what happens at the very end, on the minutes or hours time scale, you basically move all the way to the right hand side. These are like photocatalysis, photochemistry, that's fine. But this happens on very long time scales, long compared to what we are interested in. However, if you want to understand what happens at the fundamental level, what happens soon after you produce this electron hole pair or exciton, right? This, this creation is less than a femtosecond. But uh, is there anything interesting between that and the final reaction? Yes, to me, that's all we you know, spend our whole career trying to understand. There are a lot of interesting processes. By understanding these processes, we hope to intercept and control these processes so we can produce more efficient devices, either light emitting diodes or lasers or detectors or solar cells. And the many different time scales from femtosecond to picosecond, nanosecond, microsecond, millisecond. This involves, for example, relaxation of the carriers and trapping of the carrier and recombination of the carrier and a diffusion, okay? Many, many more, or can be trapped to a surface site. I'm not getting all details, but that's not the focus today. I would just want to give you a little flavor about the type of issues we are interested in our lab. So I already showed you the model. I'm going to skip that one. Now I'm going to, with a little background on quantum dots, I'm going to contrast to plasmonic metal nanoparticle. That's our focus today. They are indeed quite different. They're fundamentally, they have some similarities, but they're fundamentally quite different. For example, for quantum dots, we have the band gap I just outlined in the last few minutes. For metal, we don't have that relevant band gap that matters for the property we care here. Instead, we have a band. The band is a half field. The red means we have electrons. The green means empty. But the, for the metal, the, between the green and red, the energy difference is almost zero. Infinitesimal is small, very, very small. As a result, even thermal energy, room temperature, can bring the electron from the red region to the green region. That's why metals are very good heat conductors. They're also good electrical conductors. It does not take much energy at all to move the electron from one place to another place in space. That is because there's very small difference in energy between the conducting band and valence band. Right between them is called the Fermi level. Okay? The Fermi level for metal is if it's not doped, if the intrinsic metal or semiconductor is right in the middle of the band. For semiconductor, it's right in the middle of the band gap. So again, for a semiconductor, you would have electron going from the red to the green with some light or other excitation. You cannot be in between, that's a band gap. But for the metal, we have a lot of states here, many, many states. If you excite the electron from the red region to the green region like this, the electron can go back very, very quickly. And I'll tell you what we, actually we measured this directly uh, in 94. Um, people have measured this for bulk materials few years before that, at your MIT by Epon and Fujimoto, uh, metal films. But we did the first study of nanoparticles, of silver and gold uh, particles. But before I go further on that, let me tell you, introduce one important concept called surface plasma resonance, or SPR. In contrast to quantum dots or molecules where you have a single electron transition, you have one electron jumping from the ground state to the excited state. For metal, when we excite in the SPR region, I want to quantify, Metals also have bands. We could have another band here, for example, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about SPR. SPR is extension from, like for example, this region to the Fermi level. What happens here is that we have a group of electrons, can be hundreds of thousands of electrons. They are excited together with light. Of course, this frequency depends on metal, depends on a lot of factors, size, shape, etc., which we'll be talking about. But in any case, Instead of one electron excited in a quantum dot or molecule, in a metal, it's a group of electrons excited at SPR. So keep this in mind. This is a very important point for the whole presentation today. Okay. Now, because the lifetime of the excited electron in a metal is very short, it's about one picosecond, as I'll show you. 
in a semiconductor is at least a few nanoseconds, right? So that's like a thousand, five to thousand difference. The shorter lifetime goes with lower fluorescence. As a result, we all know quantum dots are very luminescent if you have good quantum dots. Metal nanoparticles, unless they're very, very small, they essentially do not emit light. They're not photoluminescent. So therefore, you cannot use photoluminescence as a handle for sensing or you know, any device applications. However, because the SPR absorption is not emission, but it has SPR absorption, we can use SPR as a sensing tool. Actually, there's a machine people sell called SPR in the biomedical field. They use them to quantify molecules like proteins and RNA polymers based on the amount of polymers they have on the surface, the SPR position shifts. So they can quantify quantitatively how much protein you have you know, in a given sample. That is called SPR. But actually, I'm not focused on XPR that much in our lab. We do, but the main focus in my lab is the actual surface enhanced Raman scattering. But the Raman has molecular specificity. It's like a fingerprint, like an infrared light. Okay? And it, since each molecule has a unique set of vibrational frequencies, like fingerprints on our hands, therefore it's molecular specific. And it's more powerful than UVV or fluorescence. So we focus on Raman spectroscopy, particularly surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy. Now, with that background in mind, I'm going to tell you a couple of stories uh, from this point on. Okay, I'm going to watch my time a little bit. So let me go back several hundred years ago. Okay, but I'm going very quickly. So I'm not going to go over the history of several hundred years. But this is just one step. We're going to jump back, you know, 400 years. These glasses you see in front of you is called a Roman goblet. These are just glasses. Okay. Um, with some you know, nice decoration with metal around it. But uh, if you put a candle or flashlight outside the glass, if you put outside, like here, you see the color we see here, sort of greenish. If you put a light or candle inside the glass, you see the red we see here, OK? Actually, what gives the color here we see is gold nanoparticles. Of course, people in 1600, they didn't know. Actually, 1600 years old, I'm sorry. This is not, not 1600, was one, over a thousand years ago. 1600 old, okay? So these glasses have gold nanoparticles. There's no way people would know there are nanoparticles in there because there's no machine equipment like EM machines we have today to, to determine that. But today we do know, okay? And uh, the reason they have this different, co different color is that when the candle is outside, it's a reflection. For gold, the reflection of 520 nanometer, so the green light. When it's inside, the green light is absorbed. 520 is absorbed by the nanoparticle in the glass. And what you see is the transmitted light, that's red, which makes more sense once I get into some spectroscopy. And here's an example. There are many, many different metal nanostructures. And I'll focus on three as a contrast or comparison today. Solid gold nanoparticles, the easiest one to make. That's what's in the glass, the goblets I mentioned. Or we can make them hollow. This is not trivial. That's my whole talk today. I'll share with you how we do that, why they're interesting, why they're useful. Another popular structure is nano rod. And we know, many scientists know today, that for quantum dots, the size determines the color. For metal nanoparticles, size matters a little bit, but not a lot. In contrast, Shape matters a lot. And for quantum dots, shape doesn't matter that much. So these two are very different. OK, so let me say it differently. For quantum dots, shape matters less. Size matters a lot. For metal nanostructures, size matters less. Shape matters a lot. So one can use shape as a variable to control the color or properties for different applications. OK? And let me take you back Instead of hundreds of years, a thousand years, like, you know, just decades, okay? This is the beginning of my career in plasmonics. Our first two years, I started in 92, we were working on quantum dots. In 1994, I went to a conference in Adelaide in Australia. And in this meeting, Professor C.N.R. Rao from India gave a beautiful plenary lecture about metal nanoparticles. 
That's the first time I heard about matter nanoparticles. I never heard it before. I didn't know they're interesting. I had no experience or no interest in them. Until I heard this lecture by Professor Roth. He got me interested in matter nanoparticles because of his statement that he said matter nanoparticles are more interesting, perhaps, than quantum dots because matter nanoparticles offer the possibility to study the transition from insulators to semiconductors and metal by changing size. Now, this is the true in principle. If you remember the energy diagram I showed you earlier, we go from small to large, the band gap becomes smaller. At the first, energy space is large. When the size becomes larger, the energy space becomes smaller. If it's a metal, it becomes so small, it becomes zero. That's a metal. So initially, you have insulator. We have a single atom. We have a cluster of nanoparticle. Essentially, you have a semiconductor. Then for metal, eventually, they become overlapping, the conducting valence band. So that's a metal. So yes, in principle, he's exactly right. You can do that. Now, if you think through this, you cannot do this with a semiconductor. Because for a semiconductor, you can start as an insulator. You become a semiconductor. You can never make a metal. So he got me interested. I keep thinking about it. So I came back to my lab. I told my grad students to look into literature to figure out how to make metal nanoparticles. It turns out it is easier to make a silver and gold nanoparticles than making quantum dots. So we made some nanoparticle silver first. We stick in the laser. We saw beautiful signal. But then we didn't know what we were looking at because we look into literature, there's no publication. So these are the first two papers published to our knowledge on metal nanoparticles of silver and gold. And in between our paper, two papers, a paper from France, from a big old lab, a fantastic study of copper nanoparticles in glass came out. So essentially what we're looking at here without getting the details, we are seeing a very fast relaxation of one picosecond due to electron phonon coupling. Then we have hundreds of picosecond of decay due to phonon cooling into the solvent. Okay, so that's similar to what Yipon Fujimoto observed in MIT on films of silver. So in some way, they're not that interesting because that means the particles behave similarly as a bulk material. However, if you make them very, very small, this is about you know, the 15 nanometers still like a bulk, but when you make them 55 atoms or 13 atoms, these samples are made by uh, Guangzhou Schmidt in Germany, who is a cluster chemist. And we're fortunate to collab with him. You can see the lifetimes are very different. So the point is, once you become very small between 55 and 13, they are more like a molecule. But once they are larger than 10 nanometer or larger, they are like a bulk material. That was the conclusion then. But it turns out since then, many papers have been published but more or less, people see the same, you know, double exponential due to electron phonon cooling and phonon cooling. Okay, so that's, we did that, it was interesting, we published a couple of papers, and I stopped working on it, so just to give you a timeline, that was published in 1990, we did work in 94, 95, we published in 95, 96. So for about five years, we, you know, focused on quantum dots, we stopped working on it. Until 2000, I was giving a seminar at a Wayne State University, I'll give a talk about quantum dots, who we're focusing on, and a little bit about this story I told you here. And after my seminar, uh, Professor Gregg from uh, Alabama, you know, uh, University of Alabama, he was on sabbatical in Wednesday then. He said, can I have a you know, chat with you? I said, sure. He realized I work on metal particles. And for 30 minutes, conversation we had is about this reaction I'm showing you here. Okay, that's I said here, a puzzle that started. Literally, this reaction started research in our lab for the last 22 years. The reason for this uh, uh, her conversation is that he said, first, are you aware of this reaction? I said, I reviewed some papers. But he said, did you try to reproduce it? I said, no, I did not. He said, it's not reproducible. I said, what do you mean? He said, the original paper, published in Physical Review B in 94, claims this is the UVBs of this reaction product. They assign this spectrum to a Cauchy structure. They claim inside is a gold sulfide, which is a semiconductor. It's an indirect band gap semiconductor. And a gold outside as a shell. That's the claim from the original paper. 
in 94. So by 2000, remember this six years later. So during those six years, quite a few papers were published. I, I reviewed a few of those papers. And Greg told him it's not reproducible. What he meant is that he cannot observe this crucial structure. Then I said, if it's not crucial, what do you see then? He said, I don't know. Well, we know enough about <laughs> methanol structures then. He knows, also I know that this spectrum is, you see two peaks here, a major peak of 520. That is the typical characteristic absorption of gold nanoparticles. However, if you just have a gold nanoparticle solution, you should only see this 520 peak, nothing else. However, clearly you can see this absorption in the 700 to 900 region. And this depends on the reaction time initially, but then they settle down to a peak around 700, 800, very broad. The initial assignment by this group in Japan is that the two peaks. So they know it's not just simple gold nanoparticles. There must be something else. So they attribute the combination of peaks to this crucial structure. And I didn't know this either at that when we started, you know, this you know, 22 years ago. But I can tell you today, if I know what I know today, I can tell you this cannot be, this is wrong. That assignment is, cannot be correct. Because if you have truly a crucial structure like this, highly completely degenerate crucial structure, you should see on one peak, not two, as I'll show you today. But in, 20, in 2000, year 2000, I did not know that. Greg didn't know either, okay? We were still like, a, we didn't know the theory behind, but he knows that experimentally, he did not see any crucial structure. To make a long story short, I decided to <laughs> look at this. I came back. I told my grad student, I have quite a few students then. Um, I said, let's look at this. We have chemicals in the lab. We made the uh, product. We saw the peaks. Those spec the spectra are identical or very similar to what was reported and also similar to what a Greg found. But a Greg is right. We cannot find any crucial structure when we do EM. It turns out, I thought it was a quick and a dirty experiment. This project lasted two and a half years. We did all these measurements. You know, that's not my focus today. I'm not going to talk, that's another talk by itself. We did anything we can do with a lot of collaborations with many labs and published a whole series of papers, including a few here. The punchline for today's purpose is this. Greg is right. It's not a crucial structure. However, it's not just isolated gold either, because if they were just isolated gold nanoparticles, we should not see two peaks as I mentioned earlier. So what is responsible for the two peaks? It turns out, as I said, if you just have isolated gold nanoparticles, you will see one peak on 520, nothing else. Now we know we see two peaks. So we know it's just not simply gold, isolated gold nanoparticles. Well, first we thought, oh, maybe nanorods. Nanorods have two, let me grab a pen to show you. For nanorods, you have a longitudinal mode, if the polarization of the electrical field is along the long axis, or transverse mode, if the electrical field is oscillating up and down in the, you know, uh, the transverse direction, okay? Up and down or sideways, instead of along the transverse mode. So you have two modes, basically. Transverse, degenerate, and longitudinal. Of course, for spherical particles, all the modes are degenerate. No matter which polarization you use for light, Right, in any direction, it's all degenerate, which is why we only have one peak. These have two modes or two peaks. Well, should we have two peaks with a core shell? Many thought it was. I also thought it was, because there's a lot of literature that claims so. But I can tell you today, that's not the case. If you really have a core shell like this, you should not see two peaks. You should see one, as I'll convince you in a minute. However, in the reaction I just talked about, it's not nanorods, it's not a core shell. Instead, after two years of research, over two years, that aggregates. That aggregates because the aggregates can, can form sort of a long axis this way, if the electrical field of light is along this axis, or transverse like that. And it turns out that many papers on aggregates of gold and silver nanoparticles, and they have exactly these two peaks we observe. 
Okay, done. Case closed. Aggregates. And who cares about aggregates? Because so many papers are aggregates already. Well, so we spent two and a half years. What can we use them for? So I went to a conference in New Orleans, ACS meeting. In the symposium I was in, many people are talking about surface enhanced Raman scattering as a tool for sensing chemical and biochemical species. My PhD thesis was on Raman spectroscopy. I did not do surface enhanced Raman, but I did Raman for five years, both theory and experiment. So after listening to those uh, talks, I said, aha, we just discovered uh, uh, aggregate, big aggregate, and everybody agrees aggregates are better than acid particles for SIRS because of the hot junctions. There's already a lot of studies there. So I decided that we can try to use the aggregates we discovered, or rediscovered if you want, for surface in Raman scattering. So Raman scattering is inelastic. You shine laser light, you get a scatter light back. The difference between them is the vibrational frequency which is a characteristic of a molecule. Raman signal is very small. Quantum yield is known about 10 to the minus 6. So it's very painful to the Raman usually. But if you put a molecule next to a rough and metal surface, called surface enhanced Raman scattering, discovered by Richard Van Dyne in Northwestern University uh, in the 70s, unfortunately he passed away two years ago, um, you can get a huge enhancement. Some of the enhancement the factory claim in literature are literally exaggerated, to be honest with you, but you can get millions or billions with no problem, okay? So we decided to use the substrate, the aggregates we learned to, for search. So I'll go over this part quickly, but that's another you know, application. And I work with an engineering professor, Claire Gu. Her lab works on D-shaped fibers for optical communication purpose. I was on her student thesis committee as an external member. I learned about DCF fiber. I thought, oh, that's very interesting. They use for modulators, sensors, or pressure, temperature, not for SIRS. But I said, maybe we can use this as a platform for SIRS. Because you can make a SIRS and particles, but you need a platform. You need something you can hold to build a sensor device. And I look into literature, there's no work done on SIRS sensors based on DCF fiber. And so we decided to write a proposal for the National Science Foundation, and we got funding for two rounds. So we developed a whole bunch of sensors based on d shaped fiber and a photonic crystal fiber. And uh, she did a part of the work in Tsinghua University when she was, was on sabbatical later on, okay, in China. And we also did sandwich structures and many different sensors developed between Claire and my lab. Here's one example, okay. This is for detecting bacteria, uh, Shionella. And the one in the bottom left, you see no signal, basically, with a normal source detection even. But with our photonic crystal fiber, the hollow photonic crystal fiber, we can get a beautiful signal out. And so we enhance another factor 10 by using the fiber as a platform. All right, let me back to come back to the key story today. Okay, I'm also watching my time. This background I told you so far led to the discovery of what we did later with hollow gold nanospheres. So now let me give you a little timeline, okay? So this is the 2005, around this time, okay? So several years later. We keep thinking about this issue because we learned during the process from 2000 to 2005 that in literature, there are a lot of claims of cultural structures. And I will not say all of them, but I will say many of them are not true cultural structures. I know I want to say this and make a lot of people unhappy, um, but I want to be honest with you, okay? Instead, a lot of times people are making aggregates, okay? This is easy to tell now, why? When you have aggregates, you have two peaks. When you have real cultural, you have one peak. You go to the literature, you are the judge, you look yourself, don't trust me, don't believe me. Look into the literature and see what you see. Always ask yourself, do I have one peak or two peaks? I'm claiming here, whenever you see two peaks, you don't have a cautia, period, in theory, as I will show you. So by 2004, 2005, we're still thinking about this issue. So we know aggregates are very easy to make. You can do this in 30 minutes in the lab. Even a high school student can do it. To make a single crystalline shell is extremely difficult. Actually, today, I don't know if anybody made one. Now, scientists have made cubes 
single Christian accused. Probably Yunnan Shah's lab did a beautiful work on that. But not, to my knowledge, a single nanocrystal, single crystal shell, spherical. Why? This is very difficult because of the high surface tension or surface energy. So we accept that fact. But we ask ourselves, can we make something in between? Can we pack the surface? Let's imagine inside a silica or polymer or whatever. Can we pack this with small crystals with a lot of nice grains with no space between them? For aggregates, you have space. So ions can go in and out. But if we pack them so well, perhaps no ions can go in and out. That was our motivation. Okay, we want, we want to do something in the middle. Very fortunately, very lucky, in 2005, Professor Li Jun Wan, Wan Li Jun, uh, in, uh, in Beijing, okay? He, his lab uh, submitted a paper to JPC on using cobalt as a template to make hollow shells of gold, and also they did platinum. By chance, I was the editor that you handled in that paper. And at initially, the data are not completely convincing. So actually, I wrote to Professor Wang directly, asking his lab to provide more data to convince me there are true shells, given my background I told you earlier. And his lab graciously provided more data. So I let the paper publish. After the paper is published in JPC, my grad student, Adam Schwarzberg, he's one of my best students in 30 years. He saw the paper in JPC. He said, aha, Jim, maybe we can use this way as a way to make the hollow gold nanospheres. OK, make a long story short, it took him six months to reproduce what Professor Wyatt's lab did. And in addition to what uh, the paper did, we also added a step, added more gold salt and citrate as a way to uh, make a better shell by blocking some of the pores sometimes you still have at the end of the reaction, OK? Let me show you. This is the picture you saw on my first slide. All these are just acid-made gold nanoparticles, hollow gold nanoparticles. We, we did a lot of images, hundreds of them. Here's one real image. And here's a cartoon. Okay? It's a 3D project onto a 2D plan. Therefore, it looks like a donut. But actually, it's a spherical, OK? And each one is a sample estimate. This is just photograph of that. You can see any color you want, right? Blue. Actually, one of the sample is blue like a ink. Some are purple. And this is EM data, OK? So the, the thickness of the wall is about 3 to four, 5 nanometers. The size is 30 to 50. That's what we can make then. But today, we can make a much broader range, as I'll show you later. George Schatz, who was the chief editor of JPC for many years, his lab did a theory. Even two years before, we did the experiment. So we published our first paper in 2006, following Professor Wang's work in 2005. But George's lab actually published a theory paper predicting how you can change the color based on theory, but no experiment. So we use this as a guide. We, Adam did, I should say. This graph here took several months. So this shell diameter, shell thickness, and the wavelength. Each point here is a data point, but this took a long time to play with the reaction to vary the thickness and diameter, which we can do much better today. But uh, in 2005, it was quite challenging. Here's the spectrum. You see each sample only has one peak, as I alluded to already. At that time, we didn't understand. We thought there should be two peaks, because in literature, many papers claim two peaks. So we thought there should be two peaks. And we were speculating. Maybe the other peak disappeared into the, you know, too blue or too red or something. And uh, today we understand now, actually I understood a few years later when I was writing a review article, if it's a true spherical shape, hollow structure, there should be one peak because it's completely degenerate in all directions, just like a solid particle. OK, one application we did was the source. And this is a single, not any source, it's a single nanoparticle source. We compare a single HGN, hollow gold nanosphere, with single silver nanoparticles or aggregate nanoparticles of silver. And we demonstrated that the hollow gold nanosphere is a much better source substrate in terms of consistency 
not a sensitivity, but a consistency, as illustrated here. We made measure hundreds of particles and do statistics. The red is for, from HGN, the blue is from silver. So the HGN is very uniform in size of distribution. It gives a much better search spectra. And this was also published. And the atom graduated. So that could be the end of the story, right? But the story took another turn. Adam did graduate in 2006, but I went to a conference in Orlando, Florida. In this conference, I met a professor Chun Li from MD Anderson Cancer Center. He gave a talk about something called photothermal ablation therapy of cancer. Not using hologold, of course, because he didn't have it. He was using solid gold nanoparticles. Now, my lab has interest in cancer research on and off for many years. We used to do photodynamic therapy using porphyrins to generate singular oxygen or radicals for cancer research. So cancer research is interesting to me, but I never done anything on photothermal ablation therapy. The principle is if you have a gold nanoparticle, you shine light, you generate the heat. It's very efficient. Then the heat can be used to do photothermal imaging or can kill cancer by uh, uh, basically using heat, okay? Um, so this is the idea, the principle. But his talk is using solid gold like this. I noticed in his talk, he was using a laser at 800 nanometer, as I draw here. As you can see, this absorption or extinction, at 800, that's a very little absorption. For photothermal ablation to work effectively, you need a lot of absorption, more absorption, more heat. So therefore you want strong absorption, so you should shine your laser around 520. So I asked him, why do you use 800 instead of 520? He said for the near IR, this is called a near IR, 800 region, the light goes deeper into tissue. So it's a deeper penetration. So for biomedical detection and therapy, they prefer 800 nanometer. That makes sense. Now he's a bio-organic chemist. The particles that he used was bought commercially. Of course, most of the particles, solid uh, spherical particles, they absorb around 520. So I took my laptop out. We already have the HGN as you heard so far. I said, I can send you a sample that absorbs exactly at 800. Indeed, this green, if I show you a sample here in my hand, it's a green in color, like a tree leaf when it's around 800. Anyway, I'll make a long story short. I'm watching the time a little bit. Of course, it worked, and it worked beautifully. Initially, they did a, a in vitro experiment, then did a in vivo experiment, and I'm not gonna show you all the details. These are two long papers published in cancer journals, if you're interested. All the control experiments were done, and the outcome is exactly what we expected but 10 times better than solid particles, simply because it's a much stronger absorption, so there's a more efficient generating heat. My favorite one is here, I wanna show you. We demonstrated to our knowledge the first active targeting of melanoma, hisosudio, the most deadly skin cancer, in vivo, on live mice. This experiment takes a lot of effort. He has uh, several postdocs and grad students. I'm gonna show you in a few minutes, but this literally is many, many months of hard work in the lab. And this is an example, okay? So let's focus on this spot right here. This is a cancer spot. So the HGNs are injected through the tail van of the mice, and you wait for 24 hours. Uh, sorry, you inject it, you wait for four hours, then you shine light, then you wait for 24 hours. You see this spot here? It's gone. The cancer is removed. The right hand side is left as a control. It grew doubled in 24 hours. So it's a very aggressive cancer. All the other ones are control experiments. We don't need to worry about it, okay? It works exactly the way we want it. And this treatment using the laser is one minute. So it's extremely efficient. However, there's an interesting twist. I'm gonna uh, try to wrap up in about three minutes. The twist is as follows. The sample we want the most is 800, as I told you, because we want, we can make any of these samples, but we want the one around 800. That's what the biomedical purpose is uh, best uh, satisfied. However, the catch 22 here is that this sample is the hardest one to make. Why? Because it has a thinnest shell. 
based on George Seth theory and also based on our experiment. So that's a catch-22, right? The sample you want the most is the hardest one to make. We spent the last decade. So this was discovered over 10 years ago. So it should be done, right? Very successful. But we spent the last decade, 10 years, in working on recipe strategy to make near eye absorbing more reproducible HGNs. This is one of those efforts. We use a polymer to pacify the surface to make it more reproducible in synthesis. It doesn't work. However, you see these HGNs are not very uniform in size. When it's not uniform in size, the spectrum is broad. That's not desirable for cancer or for SIRS. You can also see with polymer, it's rugged. And without polymer, it's more uniform. OK, so we continue to work on it. Now I'm going to make it very fast due to time uh, constraint here. I have several students working on this at the same time. We spend many years on this, literally, since we made the cancer project work. One of the highlights I'll show you here is by Sarah Lindley, one of my best students. Actually, she started a company three years ago based on the technology she developed in my lab. I'm going to show you a little bit here. She spent six years to work out the mechanism of the HG in synthesis, which we didn't know before. We can make them. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. We didn't know exactly why. It turns out we do know oxygen plays a role, but we don't know exactly what role oxygen is playing. So Sarah painstakingly spent six years in my lab to work out the mechanism of this reaction. I'll not give you all the details. This is published if you're interested. Uh, it's published in, uh, in 2018. She decoupled the synthesis into many steps. As I show here, you can see this beautiful cobalt, very uniform, and this very uniform HGN after she worked out the mechanism. And there's a lot of details I will not go into. We do XFs, we do a lot of detailed study. Sarah did, I should say. At the end, here's the mechanism. It turns out oxygen play a role in two critical steps. And actually, there's a cobalt boride tentative designed that is produced first if you don't have oxygen. And with oxygen, we can produce a cobalt nanoparticle, which we use as a template to make it HGN. However, if you have too much oxygen, cobalt nanoparticles oxidize in the cobalt oxide which is not what we want. So that's a very tricky balance in the amount of oxygen. But in Sarah's paper, we talk about how we can control that very, very carefully. So we can make highly reproducible, highly uniform HGN today. We can also change temperature. This is done by Frank Song, an undergrad in my lab. He's now a grad student at UCLA. By changing temperature, keeping everything else the same, we can change the absorption. And this is the change in the size and the thickness of the HGN. Not as uniform as Sarah's, but the important point here is that now we can change the outer diameter from 25 nanometer to 150 nanometer, which is remarkable. I will try to wrap it up here. We actually work on the cancer cell research and a lot of complications you have to be careful as listed here. And I'm just gonna show you a few view graphs to convince you, yes, we're doing that. One of the projects we're pursuing now is oral cancer. Because oral cancer actually is a, has very few remedies. You cannot do surgery easily. Normally it's on the gum or tongue. So there's a lot of interest. We're working with Delta Dental, an insurance company, actually dental insurance company, uh, on oral cancer research. And there's a lot of variables we have to worry about. I will skip this here. Uh, this is one example where we can have different sizes with the same color. This is something you cannot achieve with any other metal plasma structure, to my knowledge. And here we can do that because we have two variables. We have diameter, we have thickness. We can control both to achieve the same color but different size. But this took many months to do. We also do cell experiments. And as I said, this last example of biomedical application, we can use this to help with stem research, stem cell research, by using HGNs that have different color from blood, making it easier to identify the stem cell. This was in done in collaboration with South Korea. Two more, just a couple of data slides. One of my grad students demonstrated we can do two photon photoluminescence from HGN with enhanced efficiency. This was published by Evan. And more recently, we are creating gold nanostars using HGNs for SIRS. This was published very recently, 2021. 
And they see the putting silver on top of the hologram stars. Another step further, this is also published just this year. And one last one is we are detecting COVID antibody using similar multi-branched nanostars and uh, it's successful and the paper is to be submitted. I know I'm going through this last part very quickly because of time. I want to leave a few minutes for discussion. So let me wrap things up. I hope I convince you that hologram nanospheres, of course, it's just one example of many, many plasma mounting structures, but edge genes are very unique because of the two variables we can tweak, we can make it different colors, the highly degenerate spherical, you cannot do better than spherical, therefore it's one peak, this is desirable for many applications. And today we also know how to produce them in a reproducible manner with a very, very high uniformity. Of course, this is done not by me, you know, of course I'm involved, but the lab work has been done mostly by my grad students, visitors, uh, you know, this is the hard work. To do any research requires a lot of deep thinking, of course, and requires a lot of hard work. And more importantly, or equally important, requires a lot of collaboration uh, among researchers. So this indeed is a collaboration with many labs and of course funding from different agencies. Without funding, we cannot do the research. And uh, this is a future from my lab. Uh, maybe five years ago or so. And uh, as you can see, oh, sorry. Uh, you can see the very diverse a group of people. We have fun together. And uh, this is the view of UCSC, right on the campus right here. We're in the redwood trees. Uh, over here, you can see the ocean, um, Pacific Ocean. This is Santa Cruz downtown. This is a wharf for some of you who have been in Santa Cruz before. And uh, so, I want to thank you for your attention and, uh, and for the opportunity to, to exchange you know, uh, um, some ideas and, uh, uh, with you. I'm more than happy to answer questions and also you know, hear your comments either now or later on. And uh, hopefully this may be a beginning for some more collab uh, new opportunities for uh, collaboration and research and interaction. Thank you very much. John, can you hear me? Oh. Okay, I'm just hoping. Oh, thank you, Professor John. Sorry, I forgot to no open problem. the video. <laughs> no problem at all, no problem. I don't want to make sure I'm not losing everybody. <laughs> That's a little oh. scary for me. <laughs> oh, well, thank you very much for your wonderful talk. Uh, we have no a lot problem. of, uh, yeah, we have really le uh, learned a lot from it. Uh, now there's uh, quite a lot, <laughs> thank you very much. There is quite a lot of questions from the near our bro uh, broadcast uh, platforms. So uh, on behalf of them, I pick some of the questions to discuss with you. Sure, mm -hmm. of course. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 也可以讲一些 啊，这个问题答案是这样的，就是根据我知道的，如果是真的spherical的核核结构，不可能有两个峰，但是有一点点加进来是有文献报道，也有人这样说，我现在讲这个是叫dipole，dipole就是一个，比如说正电子、负电
和跟理论上呃思考的，只要是 spherical 的，就应该只有一个 dipole 的风。嗯，好的，谢谢张老师，谢谢。不客气，嗯、不客气。嗯。还有刚才你讲这个、呃，您讲这个呃 D shaped fiber， 然后有很多同学对这个呃 D shaped fiber 比较感兴趣，他们希望您提供更多的这个信息，包括它的材料啊、它的应用啊这些。啊，这个是这样的，就是说这个最简单的办法，我回去单位多说几句啊、呃，就是如果你感兴趣这个呢，你可以给我发个 email， I'm happy to send you a lot of papers。我们前前后后这个发表了几十篇文章。所以呢，我就没有还很多 review， 为了省时间呢，我就没有，我就没把这 reference 放在这里。OK， 这个 platform 确实很有意思啊、呃。不过呢，我加一句就是说，如果你感兴趣做 sensing 的话，我的建议呢是用这个 photonic crystal fiber。等一下，这个这个这个更好，这个更 sensitive， 但这个呢就稍微有一点点贵一点，各有利弊。就这个 photonic fiber 呢更 sensitive， it's about five to ten better than 那个呃 D shaped fiber。D shaped fiber 呢是，你知道 fiber 它正常的 fiber 是一个圆的，为什么叫 D shaped 呢？就是它把一部分 polish， 把它呃磨掉，磨掉之后呢，它 cross section 假设切断，那就像个 letter D 嘛， capital letter D。这个好处是什么呢？因为如果你是那个 fiber 的 end 这个那个那个那个端。Right at the end 来做的，它是面积很小的，就 micro。我们这样做呢，这个可以一个 centimeter 很长很长的，就等于说是增加了那个 centimeter 的面积。所以这个说实话，这里边没有很多科学的问题，这只是一个工程的问题。所以为什么我们当时方面是从那工程部门拿过来的？这是个应用 ，OK。但是确实是 work 的。还有一个好处什么呢？我忘了提了，这个 fiber 另外一端呢，你可以把它，比如说通过一个反应器把它弄出来。所以这个可以用在高温高压这些比较啊、呃、比较 toxic 或者是环境比较 tough 的地方，这是这个一个用处之一。也有人是用这个 end shaped fiber 的，也有的那个别人做过，我没做。这个 D shaped 是我们做的。另外就是这个呃 photonic c r o s s fiber 更 sensitive。所以如果呃不管是老同学你们如果需要这方面文献的话，给我发个 email， 就是张 at u c s d o edu。我也可以给你发些文章，你也可以到我们网站上去看，那我文章都在里边列着的。But I'm happy to provide you with references. 嗯嗯，谢谢张老师，谢谢张老师。不客气，不客气，嗯、不客气。嗯呃，我我呃，我感觉这个问题确实是很多很多人觉得这个呃这个 D shape 可能是因为第一次看到嘛，然后觉得哎呀呃好像嗯很很有意思，确实很有意思。嗯，然后不是很常见，呃、不常见，对，你先说。对，不常见，一嗯。因为以以前读文献的时候，哎，可能读的没有没有读到那么多，然后没有看到这个，哎，觉得嗯，确实是一个很新鲜的一个应用。它确实，正如您所说，它是一个很很 smart 的一个想法，一个工程上的一个很有意思的一个东西。对，嗯，其实不难做，并且是呃，还有一个 point 就是不是太难做，就是你要有机器 polish 就可以，很容易涂上去就行。嗯、对 ，OK， 嗯，好，你说讲，哎，好的，下下一个问题，张老师。呃，对，因为您刚才对这个 hollow shapes 这个 gold nano particle 这个 sphere 那个 nano sphere， 然后做了很多的解释，然后呃，您提到过它，我们可以通过控制它的 size， 控制它这个壳这个 shell 的这个厚度，然后来去调控它的这个呃发光这个颜色，呃，然后有同学呃有呃有有听众他问这样一个问题，就是说，嗯，我们是不是有一个 library？ 可以去 pick， 就是说哦，这个嗯、呃，想要哪个颜色，我们去找这个 library 就可以，或者是说我们是否可以预测这个东西？对，这个问题很好。对我首先说呃，稍微呃 clarify 一下呢，它这个是吸收光，不是发射光。嗯、OK， 嗯嗯，这是吸收谱。OK， 这个答案是 yes。理论上呢，就交际线他们已经计算了，并且现在我和一个中国教授在呃 Central Florida University， 我们在合作。你先，你计算的时候可以人和尺寸、形状现在都可以计算的，还不用量子力学，就是那个 F D T D， 就解那个 Maxwell equation， 就是说在计算机上解就行了嗯嗯，这个没问题，理论上没问题，我们可以预言的。这为什么我知道是一个风？理论上也是一个风险的。那么实验上呢，就是比较难一些。我们做了过去十年，就是在做这个问题，就是像怎么把它做的，就是这个实验条件可以制备出这个颜色出来。那诚实的讲呢，现在还不是百分之百，不是说你
，我们就根据这个 recipe follow Sarah 的那个 paper， 你到实验室马上就可以做出来。因为其实全世界很多人在呃重复这个，有的人重复出来，有的重复不出来。我也经经常有人给我发 email， 但是呢，你要是不断的去试，要慢慢琢磨，慢慢摸索。是能重复的，很多实验甚至是能重复的。这个实验本身没有问题，但实际上人和合成都是有些诀窍，就像做饭一样。我给我学生做些讲，你你你拿一个 menu 去做饭的，别人告诉你怎么做很好吃的呃呃法国餐，那不是说你一下子做出来了，并且要可能失败好多次才能做出来。这个做化学合成和有点像做饭一样的，真是有一点，你要不断的摸，要一个感觉，有时候。所以呢，但是那个 Sarah 的工作就是这个目的。我们现在呢，大部分时候新学生来了，让他摸索几个月，他就可以慢慢能够把它玩转了。就是说，想要是五百、六百、七百、八百都可以做出来，但是走一个学习的过程。就是如果你第一次去试没做出来，不要丧气，你就再去试，不断的试，也可以问我们，也可以问学生。我们有时候有时候我不知道的有问题，我就给学生，我们学生也很好，他们愿意帮。讲哪些步步骤比较关键一些，有氧气加的多少，温度多少，就很多细节。你只要掌握这些细节之后呢，是能重复出来的，不是百分之百说每天你想做出什么颜色都能做出来，但你做了多了，你可以做出一系列的颜色出来，这是没问题。就理论上实际上都可以做，简单是这样说。嗯，好的，张老师，谢谢你。哦，我的理解是这样子的，就是根据这个理论，我们可以在呃同学在做，或者是说呃研究者在做的时候，他可以根据自己的实验条件、自己实验室的这个自己的 lab 的这个条件，然后再去摸索结合着，就可以去那 repeat 或者是重复出来这个结果。对的，对的，对的呀、嗯。这个基本一个关键因素是氧气，一个是 cobalt 的尺寸，那 cobalt 开始大小决定了你后来那个内径大小，基本上是这样的。这是一个例子，就我们知道这个之间关系是什么，那个越薄越红，对吧？这个文章里边都解释的，理论到实验我们都讲的，所以说你去做的时候，一次两次甚至三次就不一定说马上能做的那么准。你想要八百，可能做出来是六百、七百，我们也经常发生的。但是如果你做十次、二十次之后是能做出来的，我们是有不同的学生、不同的访问的老师学生都能做出来。嗯嗯。对好的，感谢张老师。呃，张老师的讲座讲座真是呃非常生动，也非常幽默，更是呃理论深度非常深深入。呃，在此代表所有的观众，感谢您今天的讲座。嗯、呃，因为谢谢张老师。呃、没有那那个辛苦您。呃，因为时间关系呢，那还有很多问题就不多跟您讨论了。然后呃，在此呢也代表这个张老师，您上来，您说，嗯。嗯、呃，没什没什么，那个再次感谢张老师您的精彩报告啊，那个感谢蒋老师主持。呃，刚才张老师您的工作做的都很系统深入啊，也很非常 smart。刚才蒋老师也提到了，所以欢迎给我们那个 smart mat 投稿啊。<笑>啊，谢谢，再次没问题，可以可以，没问题没问题啊。就其他老师和学生呃同学有问题也可以给我联系。嗯，好、嗯，就是通过 email 好的,好的，再次谢谢你们，非常高兴。好的。好，谢谢张老师，那张老师再见。保持联系，好的，谢谢，谢谢，谢谢大家。好的，谢谢张老师，保持联系。好的，嗯，好，拜拜，好，拜拜，拜拜，嗯嗯，好的，拜拜 ，OK， 那我关掉了啊。哎，好嘞，那张老师再见，嗯，看怎么关，好，再见啊，好的，下次联系，下次联系，哎，好的，嗯，好的 ，OK。